Our live Q&A is just moments from starting. The panelists are ready, and I hope you've had a chance to view some of the amazing films in the series we're about to discuss. Hi, my name is Chad Beal. I'm the Acting Chief of Technical Services here at HFC, and thank you for joining us for the second live event in our HFC 50th anniversary celebration series. For those of you unfamiliar with um, what we do, the Harper's Ferry Center is the media design center for the entire National Park Service. We get our name from our location in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. We are the hub for films as well as exhibits, exhibits, maps, signs, waysides, brochures, collections, and conservation. Tonight, we are excited to present a behind the scenes of our America's Wilderness film series, featuring the filmmakers and executive producers. This will be an active Q&A session, and we encourage you to enter in questions and comments in the chat throughout the program. This event is being live captioned, so please turn on captions within YouTube if you'd like to view those. I am honored to introduce our moderator for the Q&A session, Maggie Stogner. Maggie is the director of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, which is based out of American University. As a filmmaker and professor, Maggie was also a key mentor and advisor on our film on our film fellows. I will now turn things over to Maggie. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. I'm really excited to be part of this program and to get everybody back together. And I really appreciate everyone who is joining us this evening. Uh, it's not always easy to do a virtual program, but I think we've got it uh, under control so far. Before we get into audience questions, I want to just briefly introduce you to all of our panelists. Um, and let me tell you just a little bit about the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. Uh, I have um, been director of the center for a couple of years now, and it has one of the few programs in the world that offers graduate concentration specifically in environmental and wildlife filmmaking. And experiential education is a key part of our programs. So we are very fortunate to have such an outstanding partnership with the National Park Service. Many of the films our students produce are shown at the DC Environmental Film Festival, the American Conservation Film Festival, as well as Jackson Wild, Big Sky, and others. And it is really a pleasure having the opportunity to work with such talented students who are passionate about conservation and wildlife. So this gives me an opportunity to really brag about our filmmaker panelists because they are all alum of American University School of Communication and scholars from the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. They have won numerous awards for the America's Wilderness series as well as their other films. So let me start with Sylvia Johnson. She was involved in the first year of the program. At the time, she was also producing her feature thesis film, Roaming Wild. Now, a little story. I was her thesis advisor and so impressed with her tenacity and passion while making this important film. And I remember at one point she came to me and said, I just don't like the footage that the guys I hired are shooting. So I picked up the camera and sure she did. It's a beautiful film and she shot a, a major part of it. Um, and I was just so proud of her to take that initiative. Uh, she's currently a National Geographic Explorer, no surprise there, and splits her time as creative director of Free Roaming Studios, her production company that's dedicated to visual storytelling to inspire action. And she works with the Santa Fe Dreamers Project, a nonprofit immigration legal services organization. So welcome, Sylvia. Uh, Erin Finnegan came on board during the second year of the series and made this project part of her thesis. She was also a graduate fellow for AU Center for Media and Social Impact and working on independent projects. Erin continued working as a film producer with the National Park Service for several years after graduating. She is currently a producer and project manager for the Richard Lewis Media Group in Boston, where she makes films and other kinds of media for museum exhibitions. Welcome, Erin. It's so good to see you again. It's been a while. Sarah Gulick, she was involved throughout the whole America's Wilderness program and also made the series part of her thesis work. Another highlight from her time at AU includes directing a PBS show with the Maryland Public Television about Menhaden fish in the Chesapeake Bay, which won three student Emmys. Sarah was also a professor at Marymount University and co-founder of a design studio. 
Since her America's Wilderness Fellowship, she has continued to work at Harper's Ferry Center and is now a film and digital media producer. Dream job. She is also on the selection committee and board of the American Conservation Film Festival. Welcome, Sarah. Chuck Dunkerley, Gary Oe, and Steve Shackleton, all from the National Public Park Service, and my former colleague, Chris Palmer, the founder of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, were the masterminds in setting up this program series. We have Chuck and Gary with us tonight. Chuck is a project manager with the National Park Service's Harper's Ferry Center, during the, um, serving the Pacific West and Alaska regions. He has spent the past 25 years as a filmmaker, executive producer, and media manager developing and presenting award-winning films and media for national parks. Chuck is also a past president of the American Conservation Film Festival, serving from 2010 to 2013. Welcome, Chuck. And we have Gary as the chief of the National Park Service's Wilderness Division from 2008 to 2014. Many parts of our national parks have been designated by Congress to <laughs> as wilderness. Gary was a leader in NPS's headquarters and provided guidance to wilderness managers throughout the national park systems. And since retirement, Gary has been active in international conservation efforts in Europe and South America. And I hear he's been doing quite a bit of hiking as well. So welcome everybody. Um, as uh, Chad noted, this will be an active Q&A session. So please enter any questions or comments in the chat and we will cover what we can. Now I'm gonna start off with just a few basics. Chuck, <laughs> <laughs> guess what I'm gonna ask you. What is the series? Not everybody might know really what the series is. So could you just explain please? Sure, sure. This is a uh, series of short films, about 23 films um, that really celebrate <laughs> Uh, uh, America's commitment to wilderness and specifically the national parks. And we built this series out uh, to be distributed on YouTube and the internet uh, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act in uh, Act 1914, uh, excuse me, uh, 2014. Um, so uh, that's basically what this is. Uh, yeah, that was, a little, that was a while ago. I, but the um, you know to date, uh, uh, the entire series is still out on YouTube. It's still getting traction. We have about 1.1 million views of, of all the shows cumulatively on uh, social media, and um, you know it, I'm just proud of all the work that everybody did to kind of pull this together. It was definitely a team sport. So. Um, that's that's in a nutshell what it is. <laughs> well, that's great. You know, I, I remember when um, it first started and we first started this partnership and and I just thought it was the best idea in the world because who gets to go to all these different areas? I mean, I grew up going to a lot of places, but I had no idea there were so many wilderness areas. So Gary, I'm really curious, what were your goals? I mean, why films? Why did you think that was a way to engage people in our beautiful wilderness areas? Well, I think the, um, the difficulty of, of uh, really sharing the, the wonder and majesty of, of all of these wilderness areas is getting people out there to experience them. And I, I felt like the next best thing to that would be to go out and capture some of the stories, the imagery, and um, share that uh, through social media. And, uh, and instead of, uh, you know, having people from my generation explore and, and develop these stories. Um, you know, this opportunity came up with American University to have the next generation of filmmakers um, go out, discover, uh, develop, and tell the stories. And uh, it was pure magic. It was uh, Chuck and I, and I guess Chuck's old like I am, so they are at least close, and we uh, when Aaron and um, Sylvia and Sarah would come back with with um, a potential story that they had found from an individual wilderness, we were literally stunned. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to take beautiful pictures and sunrises and and watch you know uh, wildlife moving around, but but these three women created. Um, magic, uh, the, the stories that, that really um, capture the diversity and the importance of these 
landscapes uh, and at the same time uh, really uh, provide us an opportunity to celebrate one of our country's um, boldest and most successful conservation efforts, which is preserving over 100 million acres of our public lands as America's wilderness. So um, that was my goal and um, the, the three of them and with Chuck's assistance just uh, did a tremendous job. And uh, I just can't thank American University, Chris Palmer, uh, your predecessor and uh, my former boss, Steve Shackleton, provided the guidance and the wisdom and the encouragement uh, to push forward. And, it, and it, was a, it was a wonderful project. And it's been an amazing partnership ever since. And let me just um, ask Chuck, you know, just how different was this from anything you'd seen in terms of a partnership model um, for the National Park Service? I, I really that? haven't, I've never really experienced anything like it. And um, <clears throat> it was it was great uh, because with Gary and Steve, uh, they were key in kind of making this happen and actually getting this through at a high level in the National Park Service. Because without us actually setting it up with the agreements with American University, we never would have been able to pull it off. So there was a lot of, a lot of help from way above my head that uh, really made something happen here uh, and make a cool opportunity. I mean, I think one of the things that made this unique as far as the style is it reflects something that happens in the film industry quite often, which is a pitch model as opposed to a commission model or a buyout model of, a, of how you how you get a film. So, and, you know, Gary's point, you know, was that, you know, I, I know what he's going to say about a film. He knows what I'm going to say about wilderness, but, what, you know, how do we connect with other folks who aren't, don't maybe understand that or, or see it as relevant? Um, and this was the only way, you know, you open the door and say, what do you have? You know, what, what, what are the stories? Um, and you have to check them for relevance and do ability, you know, is it, can you actually produce it? Can you do the things that we need to get done here? Is it within budget or being safe about the whole thing? There's like a myriad of stuff yeah, that it, it, it's not easy, but, <laughs> but, but at the same time, yeah, no, that, that, that was sort of the game changer uh, for me and sort of changed how I viewed, um, sort of how tight we should be holding on to our stories in the park service. Well, I, I really ad admire the vision and and the ability, um, and I'm sure the, the commitment it took to see that vision through. And it's a great segue to Sarah because um, Sarah's been involved in this from the beginning, still now, still is with the National Park Service Harper Ferry Center. And, and when you have that many different choices, I mean, so many different wilderness areas, so many different ways to think about stories. How in the world do you think about what to pitch? Where's the story? And did we just lose Sarah? Um, I could punt that to Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia, how did you come up with ideas to pitch? Oh, or maybe Sarah's back. Do you want it, Sarah? Or I can take it. Do we have you back? I tell you what, so Sylvia, you start, and then I'll I'll come back to Sarah. Okay, so how did you come up with some of the ideas to pitch? Yeah, um, we were given a wilderness area, if I remember. It's been a while, but then we were told what area to focus on, and then we would dream up stories. And I think that one of the most incredible parts about that is exactly what Chuck was saying—the creative freedom to to imagine these stories and bring the stories to the table. So. Um, for me, I think one of the things I was most interested in as a filmmaker doing this was really thinking about how to reach a broader audience and get out beyond um, the, the people that Park Service is normally reaching. So really telling stories about wilderness in new ways and figuring out how to use storytelling as a tool to create access for people who didn't traditionally have access to these places. Um, so. Often, like one of the stories I'm most proud of is one of those where we, we were able to work with youth from uh, city communities who hadn't spent a lot of time in the wilderness and figure out how to tell the story of bringing them into a space like that. Um, but I want to emphasize how incredible the creative freedom that they gave us to imagine those stories. And some of them worked really well and some of them not as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's circle back to that in a minute. I'm, I'm curious to hear from Aaron as well. You know, um, Aaron, you brought a, a cinematography style to these pieces with slow-mo and using a DSLR camera and um, and just um, 
a certain mood to them that made them feel very intimate. And I wonder if you could talk about that and, and talk about your, your creative choices in um, making these pieces. Sure, yeah. So I think for me, you know, I was always really interested in how being immersed in these wilderness areas kind of move and inspire people. And so even, you know, my first video was Shenandoah where, you know, I found two musicians who lived in the area um, uh, who used the wilderness as a source of inspiration for their music. Um, and that theme kept sort of creeping back over and over again. Um, you know, when I, I, I just sort of naturally gravitated towards that, you know, the poets in Fire Island, um, even, even some of the more immersive um, natural pieces. Um, but I really wanted to use the cinematography to sort of share that kind of met more meditative quality and um, that sort of inspiring quality of the wilderness um, with the audience. Um, and so, you know, that <laughs> I think before I came on, um, uh, Sylvia and Sarah were using a larger, heavier camera um, and a heavier tripod. And, and I was like, no, 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 <laughs> let's do a DSLR um, uh, that's a little bit lighter in weight. Um, and so that's when we started sort of transitioning to the these 5D, these Canon 5Ds with a handful of lenses, which gave a, a more cinematic quality to the footage. Um, but it, you know, it, it was a little clunky to switch between lenses and stuff. So, we, you know, gear was always on our minds and Sarah and I, did a lot of back and forth trying to figure it out the best um, uh, way of, um, of our gear, our camera packages to figure that out. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think I just really wanted to sort of show the artistic quality of these wilderness areas and then using the DSLR camera and some of these other techniques was um, a way of doing that. But it, it really created a sense of intimacy and a sense of being there. And now that we have Sarah back for a moment, I'm going to quickly <laughs> ask Sarah a question. <laughs> so, Sarah, we've been talking about how you make choices when you have so many different wilderness areas and, and you're pitching. So you have to think kind of, you know, what's going to work and how maybe to have a range of different types of stories. So what was it in your mind? What was that process about? What was that creative process of, you know, and that storytelling process of here's here's the story I want to tell, and how did you figure that out? I think, um, I'm going to try to do it with video, but I'm going to turn my video off if it doesn't if the audio isn't good. Um, I, I think a lot of the short answer is research. I think we did really I think you're going to have to turn your video off. Okay. Yeah, I think we're having some technical difficulties hearing you, Sarah. Your audio is breaking up. I think we'll, we'll come back to you, Sarah. Hopefully that signal will stabilize. So I'm going to come back to you. Meanwhile, we have some questions coming in from our viewers. And um, so, Sylvia, uh, here's one for you. I, did you face danger? I mean, was this really hard footage to capture? Were you in, out there in the scary wilderness? Or did you feel like, you know, you got out there and, and, and made things work? I mean, that's, um, you know, it's not everybody that knows how to go out in any kind of elements and actually be able to make a good film. I don't think we faced any kind of real danger. I, mean, I never felt like I was in danger. Certainly, um, we had to take the elements into account and being out in the hot desert or being stuck in a rainstorm or when we were shooting in Rocky Mountain National Park, there were uh, incredible forest fires happening all around us. So there was a lot of smoke. So we faced a lot of things like that um, and had to know how to move in those wild places and be around animals and feed ourselves and take care of ourselves. Um, but I never really felt like I was in any imminent danger. I felt way more in danger 
shooting in cities than out in the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> Chuck, I'm gonna, um, there's a question that came in and it's um, a process question, I think. Um, did parks reach out to you or did you reach out to the parks? How did that relationship work? Oh, I uh, can't hear you. I'm on mute, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but, uh, I think Gary and I can kind of both handle this one. Um, you know, this this project was funded out of a program area, which is unusual for us. Normally, parks raise the funding and then contact the Harpers Ferry Center um, to get to get the projects complete or to, to to build a film or do something like this. But th this was a national effort that uh, was out of uh, the Washington Service Office, out of DC, out of Gary's program to say, I want to do wilderness areas from around around the service. Um, and so we were, you know, we had a lot of flexibility. Flexibility. Um, some of the parks were picked because we needed that, we wanted that park. Some of them were picked because we had a project going on very close by and we could piggyback onto getting another uh, another wilderness area in. I mean, there was a lot of factors um, uh, to make that work. Um, and some of them, you know, were parts of opportunity and parts where Gary really wanted to do something. Uh, but we tried to get good regional coverage of the country, if um, even if we weren't able to get to every uh, National Park Service wilderness area. Gary, I don't know if you want to fill in on that. Yeah, I'm curious, Gary, were there like your short list of three parks, wilderness areas that you absolutely wanted to make sure got in there? No, it was uh, it was more just as an opportunity presented himself. But um, Sylvia kind of touched on it, is that we were, we were trying to capture stories of non-traditional users, you know, we didn't need the, uh, uh, you know, high, high mountain fisher person, you know, we were looking for, you know, inner city youth that, that would experience uh, like the Fire Island wilderness just outside of New York City. We were looking, as, as uh, Aaron said, finding local musicians in Shenandoah that got their inspiration. And all of these stories just started coming out and they were not traditional, you know, standard stories. And so it was, I think part of the restraint that Chuck and I had w was not to just say, go out to Yellowstone or Glacier or Yosemite and film an iconic landscape. It was just the opposite. We wanted people to actually be a bit surprised mm -hmm. that uh, wilderness experience could be um, gotten in a variety of interesting locations and that the people were all of these stories were unique they were not typical or wilderness stories that have been told before uh, I, th I especially want to highlight the one that um, the veterans um, uh, the wounded warriors uh, and um, you know that was I believe Sarah and Aaron's um, development of that story was incredible, how these people were uh, going to wilderness, boating, it was their access, and they were getting an incredible renewal experience and uh, uh, in in the National Park wilderness down there. So, so I didn't really have a short list. Uh, it was more um, a long list of possibilities. Yeah. That's great. I, I remember all, all of these. And um, Sarah, now we have you back. We're going to try again. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the wounded veterans um, one because I think that was, um, you know, one of those films that showed people that wilderness areas have a really important role in many different lives. And and I mean, a lot of the films that you made did, but that one really stuck with me for a long time. Sure. Yeah. I think one of the things, um, well, first of all, is it working? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that was really exciting about this series was kind of looking at some of these big picture themes that we wanted to convey. Um, and, you know, I'm going to kind of answer your earlier question now that I'm catching up as far as how we selected films and, you know, in the um, the one from Congaree with the veterans um, as an example. And I think some of what we were trying to do, kind of what Gary was just referencing was that idea of sort of myth busting. Um, you know, the idea that wilderness is these big Western lands that are locked up that, you know, they're only accessed by, you know, 
white male backpackers and, you know, just not something that people can um, connect with. And so we wanted to try and show, you know, the diversity of the wilderness location themselves, as well as the people that connect to these places. Um, and we were trying to really show a lot of the, the values. And so we were interested in a story um, that connected, you know, there's a huge connection between veterans um, and our public lands. And we wanted to highlight that. Um, we also wanted to have a story that kind of um, spoke to the sort of healing aspect of wilderness. And we figured kind of a, you know, a big badass um, Marine was like a really good sort of vehicle to, um, to convey that connection in a really forceful, um, forceful way. And so, you know, I had originally, I had reached out to a lot of different groups all across the country um, for you know, disability type um, or access or just different um, folks who were using wilderness that weren't sort of traditional users um, and ended up running into Team River Runner um, who connected me with um, Eric. And we were looking at doing a project in that sort of Southern area, which is how we ended up in Congaree. All right, yeah, wow. Erin, I'm gonna come back to you for a minute too about this, you know, how do you build how do you find the characters and how do you build that relationship with the characters? I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you, you know, were working with people that you didn't know before. You probably didn't have weeks or months to spend getting to know them. So when you're out in the field, out in that wilderness, how do you actually bond and, and forge that, that relationship with your characters? Yeah, well, I mean, we definitely made an effort to connect and build a relationship um, in advance of the shoot. Um, so, you know, lots of pre-interviews and getting to know people ahead of time, even just on the phone or video chats. Um, I remember talking to a whole lot of musicians um, on uh, for the Shenandoah film and uh, having people sing and perform to me over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and you got paid for that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, I think I found that most of our subjects were really just open because they were so passionate. And I think they just appreciated being able to share that passion. And in many cases, the people really made it special. You know, one, one of the most memorable moments I have was from Fire Island, where we brought this group of youth poets from the city to the park. And it was winter and it was really cold. <laughs> um, and, you know, for so many of the kids, it, it was the first time away from the city. Um, and they really had no prior experience to being in any kind of um, nature, let alone a wilderness area. And I remember we warned them how cold it was going to be and to be mindful of that. But the second we got to the ocean, they were so excited and so in awe that the first thing they did is run into the waves in like 30 degree weather. <laughs> and it's like 6 a.m. and we had a whole day of filming ahead of us. Um, and so Sarah and I were like, oh. <laughs> but, um, luckily I brought a lot of socks. Yes, yeah, like kept Sarah running out socks. The scenario and she brought all these socks and we had like all these extra jackets and hats. And so we, act, a lot of the outfits that you see in that um, are our outfits. <laughs> Um, but but it was just really special, just how excited they were, and you know how moved they were by being out there. Um, so moved that they just launched themselves into the water. <laughs> that was amazing. I thought that that was just amazing. Sylvia, how about you? Is there any one character relationship that you felt really stood out that you <clears throat> that that you felt really somebody that you bonded with in a different way or that maybe even helped you see a wilderness area in a way you hadn't seen it before? Yeah, definitely. I would say the, the Death Valley story that I was talking about earlier, we took this group of um, students who were at the University of California in Merced and were just starting to get involved with the park service with an internship. And for many of them, it was their very first time camping ever. And so we had this experience out there with them in Death Valley, which for me is not I know it's wilderness, but I, I imagine that I'm more comfortable in mountains and woods and it was very deserty. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that world through their eyes and in particular Jessica, who the film really focuses on, although we bonded with everyone in the group, she was phenomenal and she was really well-spoken and she, she talks about um, cooking her food in a can of fire, I think is what she says, <laughs> and seeing the stars like that for the first time. 
and she's really gone on to be an incredible success story. She's become a wilderness ranger and now is a fellow for the National Park Service and was invited to, to present and give an orientation to President Obama when he visited Yosemite. So she's really grown from that. And I think the experience of spending that time with their leader, Jesse Chakran, and, and the group of kids who are out there experiencing this for the first time was really powerful and amazing. And it's amazing to hear about how that just carries through for life. I mean, it's a lifetime experience. Um, there's a question that came up um, for Chuck and Gary that I, I think is so important um, about embarking on a new venture like this. Uh, and the question is, sometimes the stakes can feel very high when you're working on government mm -hmm. projects. So what did you do to buffer the filmmakers so they could be and feel super creative without overdoing the risks you might have been taking with a government, you know, organization. I'm sure Gary and I will have different answers. Uh, so Gary, why don't you go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, it, that's a real, real concern generally um, related to, um, you know, what can be a very political uh, situation, you know, in an individual park. In this case, wilderness, um, in general, wilderness was flying under the radar. And these these uh, uh, stories that were being uh, developed, discovered, told through our three filmmakers were um, so powerful that it was creating its own uh, own approval, own authority. Like, uh, like there was no no one that said we can't tell that story. You know, that's not the right story to tell. The you know the the general reaction to all of these stories was wow. You know, I I can't believe that you found that story and you told it in such a powerful way. So I there really wasn't interference being run here. This was just. Uh, sitting back and, and appreciating what these three young women uh, created and the power of, of approval just flowed right out of it. And no one ever said, stop what you're doing, you know, uh, throw that away. It was keep going. These, these are really interesting stories. And we had, we had the support, you know, pretty much, you know, at the highest, levels of the park service. And also, you know, as Chuck said, many, many of the parks superintendents specifically would come and seek us out once they saw yeah. you know, the, the makings of the series. So um, the stories, the stories got their own approval, basically. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, um, in, in the park service, we have a, you know, we, we value multiple perspectives. And I think some of the perspectives uh, that uh, everybody uh, that you three were bringing in, they didn't even know existed in the wilderness area. I mean, they, they, they were they were learning about how people, regular people were connecting with the areas that they're stewarding. Uh, which has which has a lot of uh, when you're when you're a manager you have that's a lot of power to, to, you know, it's humbling when you think you know what's happening and maybe you don't but you have this really kind of emotional sort of response when you're at Congaree or if you're Steve Shackleton kind of kind of seeing this at the high levels of um, in Washington but um, no I mean as far as as far as these projects you know but part of it was is the films were done relatively inexpensively so you know the high stakes there was a dollar figure that we were able to fly fly under the radar with that kind of helped with that um and as well i think i think just focusing on the process of the job like what what is it you're doing and, and focusing on great filmmaking great storytelling is always the key that always that always shines through right it's hard to argue with success um so at that level that's always what i tried to focus on which wasn't wasn't very difficult with these three so yeah well great stories great characters um sir i'm gonna come back to you for a minute because uh, there's a question about, you know, how how did you get the footage? I mean, people, you made it look so easy. When you see the final films, you go, wow, you know, that's just so beautiful. And a lot of people don't realize all the challenges that go into just basic things like keeping your equipment running in cold, super cold weather or humid weather or high altitude or, you know, and keeping your batteries charged up or whatever it was you had to do. So. So talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges of capturing the footage, the kinds of footage you captured. 
Sure. Um, I think there's kind of you can look at sort of like what didn't make the cut and you can kind of get the full list of things that can go wrong. Um, you know, and some of it's kind of the the basic camera stuff that you're just always managing, making sure you have media, making sure you have batteries, like making sure everything isn't too hot or too cold. I know with Aaron, we had one of our cameras just kind of shut down in Saguaro, which is kind of the way I felt too. Um, <laughs> but the, the camera got away with it. I had to keep going. Um, but a lot of that's just sort of like learning to, to manage that um, and kind of changing the gear based on what we were trying to get. Um, some of it is just, you know, you just have to kind of put in the time and, and be there and kind of try to be ready for everything as much as you can. Um, I definitely kind of still have sunset anxiety and, you know, lots of bad time lapses of sort of managing your time of do we, do we stay out and we try to get this shot now, but we need to be somewhere in the morning and just there's a just a continual um, amount of decisions, just endless decisions because you're reacting to to the weather, to the shots that you got the day before, or more to the point, maybe the shots that you weren't able to get the day before wildlife. If you're working with people, just your own. I, I remember getting sick in Death Valley and poor Sylvia had to kind of like pick up the slack and Death Valley is just a miserable place to be sick. Um, it's like $50 million for like one NyQuil or something. Um, and so there's just a lot of things that you're just kind of can continually having to um, adapt. You know, you plan everything as much as you can and you have it all worked out. Um, and then you're just trying to kind of adapt um, as much as possible. And anchoring in that, what is what do you need to walk away with? At the end of the day, no matter what goes wrong, like you still need a show. And so you're always kind of having to reassess to figure out what you need to get. Um, and, and sometimes it's just really careful cutting. We have one from um, Zion that's this like adorable family going out for the day hike. and the one kid couldn't sleep and was like coughing and got the other kid up. And so they were all cranky. So I think there's only like three minutes of the day that those kids weren't crying, but those are the three minutes that are in the film. And so it looks like everybody had a really great time. Uh, and I think they normally do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would love to just follow up on that. Cause like, I think, I don't think it, hopefully it doesn't come across in the film, but I mean, they, it is really hard work and really long days. I mean, a, the schedule on a shoot can be so grueling, especially when you're talking about nature photography, when you are constantly chasing the light. Um, so you really can't squander those sunrises mm -hmm. or sunsets. I do have that anxiety still. You're up well before dawn uh, to, to hike out to mm -hmm. a viewpoint for sunrise. Um, you won't get back until well after sunset, if not later, because maybe you stayed up to get a night time lapse. And, you know, night time lapses are unforgiving. So if you got that wrong, you might have to go out again the next night. Um, and then once you do get back, you have to charge all your batteries, offload all the footage, make your backup. So, it, you know, there is really um, long days. Um, and, you know, your adrenaline kind of kicks in and uh, you, you don't notice it during the shoot, but after the shoot, you are ready to sleep for a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but it's fine. And then you look at all the footage you got and um, hopefully it's uh, <laughs> all worth it. <laughs> and amazing films. Uh, Sylvia, I'm sure you've got something to chime in on, <laughs> on this too. What were some of your, uh, let's see, steepest learning curves? Uh, <laughs> Well, one of the things I remember as Sarah was talking is really trying to figure out how to manage our time. Like we would eventually got to a point where we had so many weeks and we knew it wasn't going to be sustainable. So we'd go shoot early in the morning, come back, try to take a nap and then shoot until late in the evening. So we had to like kind of change the rhythm of our, of our days to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I would echo what both of them were saying. It's grueling, but it's also fantastic. And I've learned the hard way that off days are as important as shoot days. <laughs> Just hard to calculate when when the light is gonna be right and the conditions are gonna be right to take the day off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't always have control over that. Yeah. Let me just ask you too, um, Sylvia, you know, you're now a, a National Geographic explorer and, and how do you, what was your takeaway from your experiences on these films 
and how did that help build your career to where you are today? I mean, I think it certainly has given me a level of credibility when applying for grants from a place like National Geographic to say that I've had this experience. And I think also being, just having been out in really challenging outdoor environments shooting, I, I noticed it a lot on the most recent shoot that we did where other people on the team clearly had, they're incredible cinematographers and, and team members, but didn't have the same kind of expedition outdoor filming experience. And, and it really shows when those days get hard and long and hot and sticky and sandy and like all the things that happen, um, it, it, it's really helpful to have the experience of knowing what it takes to get through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's real. Erin, <laughs> anything more you'd like to add on that note, just in terms of your own career and how the experience um, making these Wilderness, America's Wilderness programs kind of fed into your career path? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think it was definitely a stepping stone for me. Um, you know, I, right now I work um, doing mainly experiential media for physical spaces, so mostly museum work. Um, and, and, you know, doing some of that, some of the work we did, not all of it was America's Wilderness, so some of it, you know, we did for some of the park visitor centers. And, um, and that kind of led to that interest in uh, physical spaces and museums um, specifically. Um, so, you know, that was uh, a natural stepping stone and um, the experiences of, you know, all, all of this portfolio, this rich portfolio of work that we generated from this definitely helped a lot in um, being able to decide my fate and um, go the route that I wanted to go. So, Sarah, I'm going to um, bounce this one to you as well. How did the experience of making these um, films influence and, and set a trajectory for your career path? And you're the one who's still at Harper's Ferry Center, still making great films. So um, that may be self-evident, but, um, you know, this, that may be self-evident, but um, that may be self-evident, but I uh, feedback. Yeah, I think um, I think for me it's kind of obvious the impact um, since I'm still um, can you hear me? I can't tell I got a head shake um, it's, it's not a great connection let's see if the connection will stabilize and I'm going to just come to Chuck and Gary for a minute because somebody's asked and I think probably a lot of people are wondering this with today's 360 technology have you thought about um, doing a series that's more of a 360 virtual experience so people can really explore the wilderness in that um, way from their home? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, the project trick there is. Um, but basically, um, it takes money and time. There needs to be a project for us to be able to do that. It's not inexpensive to get out into the world and do this. Um, and we want to do it at a high level and make sure we're doing it at a high level and make sure we're doing it at a Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, world where our technology keeps evolving and, and evolving and um, but i hope that someday you know there's been tremendous uh fun with different kinds of um critter cams and the bear cam and <laughs> so you've been continuing to explore different ways of of connecting people to different uh, wilderness areas which is just fantastic um gary a question for you is there anything that you felt, um, did, did this fit your vision? I mean, is there anything you felt that didn't fit or that you were surprised by, or is this really what you envisioned when you embarked on, on this series? Uh, the, the program uh, definitely, you know, to say it fit my vision, um, I really didn't know the uh, breadth and depth of the storytelling that we would uh, create. And so I was um, 
amazed at what what we did together. And so um, to say that I had the vision for this at the beginning, I'm not that smart, you know. I I um, but I I believed in uh, the people that were coming together to create something very special. And I feel like the the films speak for themselves. Uh, I did also want to say that that the cherry on the 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 uh, ice cream sundae or whatever was that. Um, uh, uh, and unfortunately, Sylvia couldn't go with us, but the rest of the team got to go and film President Carter give the uh, closing or the opening remarks for the 2014 Wilderness Conference. And uh, um, to go from, uh, you know, just admiring President Carter to be sitting there filming him, um, answering questions about how important wilderness is to him and opportunities for future preservation and, uh, and celebrating our nation's success was, was a real honor. And none of that could have happened unless we took these uh, chances and created this America's Wilderness Program. And then lo and behold, you know, January 15th of 2014, the four of us are sitting there with President Carter talking about wilderness. And so, um, you know, I think to believe in your dreams and to assemble spirited, like-minded people and celebrate what's truly unique about this country and its natural wealth. Uh, this is a excellent example of that. And, and once again, I appreciate Harper's Ferry Center and American University Center for Environmental Filmmaking and specifically these three filmmakers for uh, just creating an amazing uh, program that, that will, as Chuck said, over what, 60,000 people a year, every year are still looking at these films and getting us a, a slice of inspiration. So, but thank you. Yeah, well, thank you because this was just such a tremendous opportunity and it created a, um, a model for what can be done and set a very high bar. <laughs> Good, <laughs> um, I like you, high bars. Yeah. Sir, we have you back quick. I'm slipping in a question. Were there any, um, <laughs> any, um, particular high points or kind of coolest moments that you'd like to share with us? I mean, you all had great experiences and I know there are a lot, but is there any one that comes to mind? I think there, I mean, it is kind of the whole, there were just the whole thing was so fantastic getting to work with so many different parks and so many different um, people like park staff, the subjects, just people behind the scenes. Like there's just so many different amazing people that are connected to these places, but um, for me, some of the like ultimate peaks when we got to fly with Lynn Ellis, um, you know, in that Bush airplane over Wrangell St. Elias. I mean, that's like, wow. you know, that will always be <laughs> like a lifetime. Like that's, I'm not worried about trying to top that. Um, that was absolutely like one of those, like, is this real? Am I really here? Um, kind of moments for sure. And, but I think there were a lot of those like, um, you know, being an Olympic out in that field with all the marmots singing or the first time we kind of came up at Cascade Pass and you're like looking out over that or, um, you know, paddling through um, Congaree or just Death Valley, just all of it is so surreal looking. So I think there were kind of a lot of those moments that you were just really struck with sort of awe, I think was really a big emotion going, going through all of this. It was just kind of that you know, wow. Yeah, wow. wow. <laughs> Aaron, um, I just gonna ask you the same thing, kind of coolest moment, but um, also let us know, and, and I, I, Sarah and I have had this conversation before, like you must have had all this outdoor experience before you went to do mm -hmm. these kinds of films, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I had, a, I had a little bit, you know, I had done some backpacking trips in college and before um, in high school, I know Sarah um, hadn't. <laughs> by the time I was, by the time I joined Sarah, she was a, a pro. So um, I know Sylvia. Sylvia got the uh, 
<laughs> got the novice <laughs> um, camper backpacker that Sarah was in the first year. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> um, it's true. But, but yeah. But but uh, you know but it's it's great because obviously Sarah's evolved too and I you know I evolved from the experience as well um, and you know I think for me in terms of production experience one I, one of my favorite parts was definitely Olympic and I think the reason for that was um, that the subject for that one which was these diverse soundscapes of the park was kind of exploratory by nature it almost required us to slow down and to sit and to listen and to just be fully immersed ourselves in the natural environment because that was the intention of the video um and it was just a really meditative experience and i remember being in that meadow at hurricane ridge that sarah was describing mm -hmm. we were just surrounded by these wa purple wildflowers at golden hour sunset um and i was so like absorbed with trying to get the buzzing sound of these bees around these flowers um, that I hadn't noticed when a herd of deer made their way into the meadow. And I look up and I suddenly realize that I'm completely surrounded by all these deer who are really close to me. And for a moment, I just felt like I was kind of part of that ecosystem. And so it was really just a magical experience to feel so surrounded. I think that, that you just described exactly why wilderness areas are so amazing and and so necessary and and we hope that everybody gets to experience them if not in person through your films i mean just those kinds of moments that are so awe inspiring absolutely mm -hmm. sylvia one one last coolest moment or a, a moment that really sticks with you I don't know, Sarah and, and Aaron did such a good job. I think it is the cumulative experience of the different places and, and moments. Being out there with those kids when they were camping, seeing the stars for the first time was unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I think that's the one that sticks out the most too. But the other, actually going to Rocky Mountain National Park, which is a park that I had been to a lot because I lived in Colorado and had spent a lot of time in the park and to be there in a very different experience, making a film about it and kind of seeing it through Sarah's eyes, who hadn't spent time in places like that, um, was really eye-opening to me and, and helped me think about how could you tell stories about places like this through to people who hadn't had that kind of experience that I had had in places like that. So that was really powerful. Yeah, yeah. I remember Sylvia was upset because there was a lot of smoke when we were there. And she's like, this isn't what it looks like. You're supposed to be able to see the mountains forever. And I was like, well, it's something. Like, I'm sorry, this is what it's going to look like now. Um, <laughs> she's like, no. But Well, yeah. Sarah, what, what film did you not get to make yet that you really want to make still? Um. That was, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a long list. I'm sure there's a <laughs> well, lot. There's, there's one in particular, though, that was the one that got away. Um, there was this super cool um, guy that I had been messaging with that was quadriplegic um, that was based near um, Apostle Islands. And he was, like, really active and getting boat ramps in and all of these super cool things. And he was a kayaker. And he was just a really, really cool guy. And we just, like, we didn't get, you know, just like the timing and the locations and being able to get there and funding all of that. And he moved, it was just one of those ones that just like, I still think that would have been a really cool film. I mean, there's like an infinite number of cool films, but um, but that one, he was just like so enthusiastic and passionate about, um, about the wilderness and about sharing it with other people. You know, he has an organization now called like Wheels to Water. And so like, he's kept that drive um, and he, that, he would have been a cool ambassador for wilderness for sure. Maybe still to come. <laughs> Aaron, is there one that uh, you felt got away or that you still would just love to do? Um, or that you could uh, maybe hand down to the next generation of filmmakers coming through? <laughs> oh gosh, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, I know that um, I was really interested in doing a night skies one um, when we were out in Arizona. Um, and I think that would have been really interesting. We did, and we were out in Arizona. We, we probably could have done that. I'm not sure what got away from us that we didn't end up doing that. But um, but I, I think that sort of that would be really cool. And and you know that effort to sort of cut down on light pollution so that the night skies can be kind of more pristine and preserved. Um, 
it, it's just it's just a fun idea. So um, maybe someone in the future can. <laughs> I think the only reason we didn't do night skies was because the super cool paleontologist got back to you first. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like a really good excuse. How many people have that yeah. excuse? Yeah, that super cool paleontologist <laughs> just wiped us out. There. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like, so you know, do you do you have one that you really um still you know and we're all still making films so there's always an opportunity but was there one that you really had high on your list that you just didn't have an opportunity to do yet? Well, there are lots of parks I still really wanted to go to. I was yeah. not with the, the fellowship as long as I would have loved to, so I definitely didn't didn't go to all the parks that I had on my list. Um but I would love to do a story about horse packing in national parks and experiencing that space through on another living animal. So I think that'd be really amazing. Yeah, that would be that, great. That's actually another story that got away. I had some really cool uh, horse packers that, um, this was when I was like researching um, ability stuff that did um, like packed in their wheelchairs and everything and it was super cool, but also got away. That's kind of funny, it wasn't for the, for the when I was working at the park, it was actually later um, working at Richard Lewis Media Group. But I did do, I get, I got to sort of follow some horse packers, uh, or actually some rangers who were um, pretending to be horse packers at Sequoia Kings Canyon to do a best practices video for them. That was that it was really cool to, um, to see. Yeah. That okay. So I'm just going to share a little story. But my earliest memory being in the wilderness was Kings Canyon doing burrow pack trips with my family. Oh. <laughs> I think I was four. <laughs> we had the burrow packs and then one with another family too. And then one that uh, we all took turns riding. I think the youngest of us was three. <laughs> We're all wow. out there with a bunch of little kids running around and I'll never forget that experience. It was just wonderful. The <laughs> cold mountain lakes, oh my gosh. I mean, you just, the sensations of the wilderness are really amazing and you mm -hmm. feel them. And, and the three of you really brought those feelings and those sensations through in your films to an extraordinary extent. I, I really applaud you all. It's still a high bar that you set and, um, and those films are timeless. And I'm really delighted, Chuck, to hear from you that the views are so still so high every year because, you know, but like the wilderness, it's timeless and it's there for all of us to enjoy either in person or through the films. So I, I just want to congratulate all of you again. It's so great to see all of you. <laughs> My talented former students from the Center for Environmental Film Filmmaking. Really a pleasure. <laughs> okay, Gary, I'm going to come back. One more question to you. And that is, if you had to do it all over again, would there be anything different you'd do? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I would try twice as hard, three times as hard to get more money to do more of it because I think these <laughs> these uh, windows Good into wilderness are incredible. And working with uh, talented filmmakers from universities and uh, working with park managers to tell stories is definitely something we need to do more of. So I would have just done more. I would have tried harder, but but what we have is pretty special. Yeah, it really is. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. And Chuck, I, I know that there's probably some people who tuned in to this saying, how can I get that position? How can <laughs> I get that? Um, any advice for those who might be interested? You know what skill sets or what mindsets do they need to have to sure. um, to meet your criteria? Sure. Well, there's um, there's a lot of things um, that you know <laughs> Sylvia, uh, Sylvia, Sarah, and Aaron all have that you know make them make them great uh, at what they do and great filmmakers. And um, but but generally, um, you know, we're looking for someone who's tenacious, who knows how to deliver, who knows how a good sense for story. Um, and, uh, you know, is focused on the end product and making, getting something out in the world, you know, that's, that, that's important. Um, and, you know, really a lot of these opportunities come up through universities and through master programs, um, because, you know, there's vehicles that we can kind of work with, uh, places like American University and the Center for Environmental Filmmaking or other universities where opportunities exist there that don't exist, you know, in the private sector, um, just because of, 
just sort of the way way it works. Um, so if you're at a university and you want to, you know, um, take advantage of those programs as they come up, because there's some there's some cool stuff that potentially is going to be out there. Um, as far as uh, working for the federal government and the National Park Service, uh, there's a myriad of websites that can help you out with that. I'm not the guy uh, to kind of walk you through all the details on it. Um, but as far as good filmmaking, uh, you know, having you know, being committed to the shot. I'm, I'm happy to hear Sunset Anxiety still exists because I have it too after so many years of, of having done this. I know, I, I think I instilled it, but... Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, um, but at any rate, I mean, uh, being committed to the shots, being committed to the story and really serving the story and what you're trying to do is is, is key in, in everything we do, so. Um, yeah. I'm just happy the Harpers Ferry Center, as a as a as a service center within the National Park Service, was able to take this on, support it, and kind of keep it moving. Uh, and I'm happy we were able to house it here. And I hope we get to do something like this again in the future. Yeah, well, I I can't tell you how much um, I appreciate it. You know, the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. Um, I'm just delighted that Chris Palmer and Gary were able to get it off the ground, and Chucky were right there the entire time, and that and we got it launched with three such talented students. Um, I'm and Steve Shackleton was key in And Steve too. Shackleton, absolutely. <laughs> yes, so, absolutely. Sorry right. to leave him out. He's, he's definitely part of it. Um, I'm just going to do a plug for the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. If anybody is interested in learning more, it's a very easy website. It's just www.environmentalfilm.org. Please check it out. And um, again, thank you. This was just an extraordinary evening really enjoyed seeing everybody and thank you all for joining us and chad back to you thank you maggie i appreciate um all of pre all our presenters and thank you everyone for joining us out there in youtube land um this i want to remind people this live event will be available as a replay on our youtube channel later on if you are interested in learning more about the Center of Environmental Filmmaking, making HFC, or our 50th anniversary celebration, live events, or our ongoing film festival, please check out the links in the YouTube description. We also have Sarah's uh, contact information there if you have any follow-up questions. Again, thank you again, and we'll look forward, we'll see you at the next one.